Hello, this is Bernadette Brady. This is a lecture on visual astrology that I presented for the Astrological Association of the UK in their York Conference in October of 2005. I've broken the lecture up into different smaller parts for you so it's easier for you to download off the internet. So once you finish one part, simply go to the next part when you, uh, when you wish to. Okay, enjoy this inaugural lecture to the astrological community about the concepts of visual astrology. I want to just precursor this. Is, is, this is new work, uh, and it's pr it'll, I'll probably be lecturing this in the next 20 years, and in 20 years' time I'll say, this is new work. Right? I'm, I'm very aware of that. And indeed, it's, it's so new that even late last night, after dancing, etc., that I went back and I added another whole new section to it based on the Charles Carter Memorial Lecture of Andre Barbeau, which was quite inspirational on many levels because I wanted to have a look at some of the things he was talking about but in the sky. This is basically about looking at the sky um, and what I call this astrology is visual astrology. I've named it visual astrology for want of another name. If someone wants to name it something else, fine, I don't have a problem. But it is simply looking at the whole sky. And if we look at charts, this is a chart as we would have constructed it before the 18th century, in that we may have drawn it in a square, etc., but basically we would have had the points up and to Saturn, and we would have an ascendant. We've had houses in some way, manner, or form. We may have had um, different lots on it, Arabic parts, just depending on the nature of our astrology. But this was a concept of a horoscope. These are the points we actually had on it. This is what we constructed. And astrology basically stayed in this form for maybe 17, 1800 years from the birth of horoscopic astrology, which is Hellenistic, right up until the 18th century. This is what we did. This, is, this was the horoscope. It was very stable format. And that's the first thing I want to impress upon you. It was a very stable format. Of course, we get the changes starting to come in. And the first change we get is a change of aspecting. We get uh, Kepler aspects coming in, so we lose the aspecting by moiety, which is, is moving. The, the difference of that is that the planets which created their own aspects, they were entities in their own right that created their own aspects. We remove that from them. We make them hunks of orbiting rock, and we make the geometry more important than the planet. So it's a step away from the pagan astrology. It's a step away from the deification of the sky. I, I think it's important to understand what Kepler did. I'm not saying he's wrong, it's just that I don't like it. Right? <laughs> um, but that's what the effect was. That, and we started aspecting across signs, etc., um, which immediately removes the, the deity of the planet as, as an entity. And, and of course we got um, Uranus coming in. So we start to get a new planet and we have Neptune coming in by this stage at the beginning of the 20th century. So this is what we had as a horoscope. And we draw it up in different ways. Different cultures would draw them slightly different ways, etc. But this was basically it. When most of us got into astrology, then we had this type of thing happening. So we've got a plume has come in, we've got Chiron has come in, and of course we have now got a full use of Kepler. And so when I first got into astrology, this was the sort of chart that you put together. And what's important, this change from a very format that we've had for 1800 years or so, suddenly as we moved into, from the Enlightenment onwards, started to change. We started to populate it with more things. We removed the deification from the sky. We made the geometry more important than the planets. And we started adding new things onto the ecliptic. Tied to the ecliptic, but there we were. And of course, the extreme of this is now. <laughs> and... Oh, people come up to me with charts like this at conferences, I'm sure. <laughs> this, all I've done to create this is I've gone into Solify and I've just said, I'll have everything, please. <laughs> right? <laughs> and I haven't even added the midpoints. <laughs> What's happening? What are we doing to our astrology? What is going on? What we're doing is we're trying to embrace post-modernity. We're trying to hear other voices. We're trying to step into some form of pluralistic philosophy without really knowing what we're doing. 
and we're trying to do it within a framework of our ecliptic. And there's only so many degrees on the ecliptic. There's only so much you can do with it. And if you get this, it, it becomes meaningless. It becomes meaningless. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the ecliptic, but it is the place of planets and not necessarily the place of everything else. If we want more voices in our astrology to reflect this postmodern world we're moving into, and I think we should have more voices in our astrology. If we want more voices, maybe we've got to be brave enough to let go of our security blanket called the ecliptic. Maybe we've just got to let go of it a little bit. So let's go back to basics. Basics, right? This is tonight. This is about midnight tonight. This is Saturn rising tonight. So we've got Saturn rising up here along on the horizon. It's about midnight. The sun's down there on the icy. Here's the eclipse thundering in a few hours before the eclipse. And we've got Mars above the horizon. And these two planets would not be visible, but they are above the horizon. This is basics. What are we actually looking at? What are we trying to chart? What are we trying to dimensional map representing something else but what's happened is we've got so used to the map we forgot that it is just a map it's not the territory it is a map if we think this is all then it's like looking at a map of um, New York and thinking you've been there because you're looking at the map the map is not New York is it Madeline no <laughs> right there's a lot more to New York than just the road map. As we can say that about London, we can say that about anywhere. This is a map. It is not the territory. That's the important thing to understand. It's an extremely good map. I love horoscopic astrology. So, you know, it's fantastic. But let's not try and make the map do absolutely everything. So what is the, the map's good at this. What is the map trying to represent? It's trying to represent this. And this is the sky for that map. This is the sky for that exact same moment here in York. This happens tonight. And here we have Saturn about to rise. This is the horizon line here. So the black area is below the horizon. The dark blue is above the horizon. So this is the horizon line. This white line is the ecliptic. So where the ecliptic cuts the horizon in the east is the ascendant. So that's the ascendant that we know. Here's Saturn below the ascendant in the first house. Here's Mars above the ascendant up higher in the chart and we see Mars is, hang on, I've just, my technology just, every now and again it does this. I'm just trying to show you the chart again. But you see Mars is up there in Taurus, Saturn below the ascendant and there we have it there, up there above the horizon line and Saturn below the ascendant. So is everybody happy? Have you, have you got your bearings? in looking at that. I, a lot of astrologers don't actually have an eye for the sky. Um, and so this is, this is what the map is trying to do. And here we see Orion rising. Here we have the constellation of Taurus and Mars amongst the stars of Taurus. I'm not talking sidereally. I'm not talking uh, tropical zodiac. I'm simply talking that it's amongst the stars of Taurus. And Saturn, Saturn amongst the stars of Cancer. So what we're doing with our map is we're mapping this and we have to map it in a two-dimensional way. And all we're doing is that we're taking the ecliptic and we're making that our rim here. If you can imagine that this, the chart, is a CD disc and you take the CD disc off that page, turn it on its side and slide it into this orb and so you're looking at just the rim of it. Here's the rim here and you're looking at just the rim there, it's slid in, and you're seeing the Saturn there and the Mars there, but you're, just, you're looking at the chart from that rim, from side on, and then we see the whole sky, and we see what it's trying to represent. But in doing that, in creating the horoscope, that became a nightmare because they couldn't represent all of this on this two-dimensional framework, and we get the development of the horoscope. So they had to make a slight sacrifice in drawing this map. They had to lose a little bit of the detail of New York. Do you know that? They had to strip it down to make it workable. So they decided to do this. This is the strip down. This is what got lost. The sky. Right? So 
really, really good with the ecliptic, really good with the planets, right? really good with the geometry in terms of the, the angles, the horizon, the intersection, the, the um, ascendant, the MC, which is the point of the culmination. I haven't got the, the great lines of longitude on there, but it will cross through there. So maintaining the angles of the sky, but having to lose the rest because it couldn't be represented on the map. Somewhere along the line, someone got guilty about that. Right? And, and indeed, Ptolemy very nicely and very conveniently in trying to work out the rates of precession had tabulated a whole lot of stars into ecliptical degrees. And he did that in his Almagas, his great work. He didn't do it in his Tetra Biblos, which is his astrology book. <laughs> what happened was is that we put the stars back into our system but we had no way of representing them in our map unless we could get them onto the ecliptic. And so what we did is we took the poles and we only actually took the poles of the equator from about the 13th century onward. Um, they used to use the poles of the ecliptic, which were actually about here. But we took the poles of the equator, we drew lines of longitude down between well, from the North Pole to the South Pole, and we would use those lines to project stars onto the ecliptic. So like Capella here, if you, t if you run it down an arc parallel to that line, it would cut the ecliptic about here. And we would say that Capella was in so many degrees of Gemini. We would say Aldebaran here projected back so many degrees of Gemini. We'd do the same with Betelgeuse up to about naught degrees of Cancer. Procyon up there. Canopus down here in the south projected all the way back up here into early degrees of Cancer. And that way we could actually put all of these stars onto our rim of our map. Yes. And projected back down to where they cut the ecliptic. Now, when we do that, we're actually seeing the stars as individual points and we're disconnecting them from their constellations. So let's look at that. Here's the same sky again, but just with all the stars and the constellations on. This is still the same thing, Saturn rising here and there's Mars. So what I'm actually saying is that this constellation here, Orion, the different stars in it are broken up and projected back up onto the ecliptic. And you can see that they're going to mix up with the stars of this constellation and the stars of that constellation. They're going to be mixed together along the ecliptic. They're going to be dissected and put into a blender. And here we have the constellation of Orion. Here it is there. There's an image of it. This is a, a magnificent Bronze Age piece of mythology of, of a conquering warrior. Um, it wrapped up in Orion is all things to do with the hero. This is our first hero. This is a Gilgamesh figure. This is the idea of the warrior who conquers. And this is the first warrior who dies and goes into the underworld. He's the very first one. To the Egyptians, he was God. He was also the Pharaoh. He didn't symbolize God. He wasn't an image of God. He was God. And we're going to mix that. We're going to disregard all of that human mythology on that constellation. Just disregard it. Break it up into stars and actually project it back up here and mix it up with this great bull. This great and glorious bull which is even older than Orion. We don't know where the bull comes from. It is there right, as a great bull. And once you see the bull in the sky you will always see the bull in the sky. He is huge. He is powerful. He knocks you off your feet on a clear night. He is so awesome in the sky. He is charging. The story, my story here, is that the conquering hero comes and finally fights the bull, the great bull. This is one of the reasons he's such a hero. He fights the bull and conquers the bull. But we're mixing all of Orion's mythology with the mythology of Taurus. And I'm not talking about the zodiac sign Taurus now. I'm, I'm not, you know, on everything we think about Taurus. I'm talking about the constellation of the great bull. But just as we mix Orion with that, there's this constellation here, Perseus, and we can see that his stars are going to be mixed up with the bull as well. And here's Perseus here, another great hero. He carries Argol, the star Argol, in his hands. But this constellation is even older than these. This is, uh, this is the transition between the 
the Neolithic and the Paleolithic, sorry, the Paleolithic to the Neolithic. This is the beginning of the concept of sovereignty in the whole psyche of humanity. And he is approaching Andromeda here, who is a woman on her back with her legs apart. And he carries a large sword erect in front of him. I'll let you fill in the, the obvious sky story which is being told. It's a story of, of human fertility and, of, the, and of, of procreation. And this is the prince and that's the princess. And further over here that's out of sight is the king and the queen. This is the royal family. Such a, a deep thing inside us about the, the marriage of, of two young people because they represent not only their own happiness, but they represent the fertility of humanity, don't they? We all get moved by two young people happily married or whatever. So if we project Perseus's stars down onto the ecliptic via this method, mix them with the bull, mix them with Orion, we're scrambling things. And to make it worse, there's this beautiful constellation that runs all the way down to the South Pole, Eridanus, the river, ambling through the sky. And you can see that all of its stars are going to be scrambled onto the ecliptic as well, mixed up with these. So we have Eridanus, the river, here, starting from the feet of Orion, going all the way past Cetus the whale, which we'll talk more about. The sea monster really is not a whale. Um, right down to the phoenix here in the South Pole, it's just around this area on the image. So we're taking all of that imagery and we're scrambling it. And the, and the only way we can therefore handle it is to ignore all of that human mythology. And I don't think it's right as astrologers that we do that. I think one of the things I think we all agree with is the myths that we have been placing in the sky for the last 300,000 years, and that's what they estimate, that there is some value there, that there is, we have a link to that. We are born from this. So what can we do? Was there another way of doing this? Can we work with these stars and these stories with our maps, with our charts, in a way that is respectful of these different voices? without causing them to be scrambled and to walk along the pathway of the sun, because that's what it is. There was. This finishes the first part of this lecture, which is just introducing the reasons as to why we should move forward into visual astrology to add that to our horoscopic craft. And when you're ready now, go on to the second part.